Please be seated. I will be reading the first part of our first scripture, John 11, verses 1 to 4. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Amen. And I'm gonna pick up and I'm going to read from 32 to 37. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them had said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind kept this man from dying? I'm going to also read Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Solomon, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very, very early on that first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. Are you looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified? He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples, and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Word of the Lord. Uh, again, before I get, get started, I want to thank everyone that helped last week at Shadfest, both days. It was a lot of work by everybody. It was a beautiful weekend. It was a lot of fun. Especially, and su Sunday was a lot of work getting the bells outside and playing, but I think everybody enjoyed it. We had a pretty good crowd in front of us, and um, we might try that again. So, how many of you have seen the movie Titanic? Do you remember the scene when Captain Smith tells Bruce Ismay, he was the chairman of the White Star Line that owned the Titanic? And he told him everything was going well, and Bruce Ismay tells him to go full speed ahead and make some headlines. And the captain does what he says, and we all know if they went a little slower, maybe they wouldn't have hit that iceberg. So as you're watching it, and you see a few times where they make mistakes and could have avoided the tragedy that happened. As you're watching it, you talk to yourself, and you try to project some common sense of anything to get their attention instead of the headlines that they made. But the writers couldn't write it differently because that's the way it happened for real. And on another point, did you ever meet someone who joins in in whatever you're doing and then questions how you're doing it? Why are you doing it that way? Why? Sometimes that's me. This is going to be my most challenging sermon because I'm going to question why the stone was rolled away. And maybe I'm not qualified to do this, 
But as I'm reading the Bible, do you question anything in it? Some, something that grabs your attention. So you research that part of the Bible. To put your faith into Jesus should be something you really understand and believe. And before I met my wife, I wasn't religious at all. I was a very busy and had an attitude towards living for the moment. In my 20s, I could go a couple days without sleep. And I kind of had the attitude that sleeping was a waste of time. Plus, you never get anything accomplished when you're sleeping. Sometimes I just didn't want the day to end. But I've always had an ear for music. And lyrics to a good song grabbed my attention. When I met Sue, she was in a bell choir in a different church, and even the bells there grabbed my attention. But enough about me. There are so many wonderful stories in the Bible to read and research in depth about, so many miraculous things to explore. One that's not explained too much is why the stone covering the tomb is rolled away, even though it was guarded by Roman soldiers. As we read and learn about Jesus in the New Testament, we could find other lessons in the Old Testament that pointed out that something big was coming. If you look deep enough, we could find Jesus in every book of the Bible. That's the part of researching when you're questioning. One of the ones being in the book of Daniel, when King Darius was advised to put Daniel in the lion's den. So Daniel 6, 6 through 22. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then, without any, then he returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without entertainment being brought to him. But he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, he got up and hurried down to the lion's den. And when he got near the lion's den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue from the lions? And Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. The stone was rolled away and he was set free. Now most of us have heard Jonah's saga, saga from childhood. God had instructed him to go to the city of Naive and preach, Nineveh, and preach. Instead, he boarded a ship and headed in the opposite direction, found himself in a violent storm, was cast overboard, and swallowed by a great fish. For three days and three nights, he tossed in the belly of that monster as it journeyed through the depths of the sea. Jonah 2.10, then God commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah into dry land, onto dry land. Jonah 3, 1. He took advantage of it, got up, and headed straight for Nineveh and the second chance. But the ultimate comeback story of all time took place 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on a Roman cross and placed in a borrowed tomb. He was dead. Some of his closest followers dejected and defeated and even exclaimed in Luke 24, 21, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They fled the scene, leaving their hope buried in the tomb. But on the third day, Jesus come, came back. He burst forth from the tomb to live evermore. Earlier, when Jesus had predict, predicted his future resurrection, he pointed back in time to the prophet Jonah, as if to say, I was there with Jonah. Those were my words that came to him a second time. Once earlier, 
When asked for some sign of his authenticity, he replied from Matthew 12, 39 and 40, no sign will be given to accept the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah was a sign of the Lord's own death and resurrection. Our Lord was showing that he was, one, was the one greater than Jonah who would have come back from the grave. The living Lord and Savior still offering second chances today. Here he is in the midst of, a, of the book of Jonah. That he is the word of the Lord that came to Jonah a second time. He is the God of second chances to any and all who will believe. It is never too late to start a new beginning with him. Standing at the grave of Lazarus, Jesus proclaimed, John 11, 25, 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. Do you believe this? Speaking of Lazarus and second chances, let's go back to John eleven thirty four to 46. Where have you laid him? Jesus said, come and see, Lord. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews see, said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man kept this man from dying. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And Jesus said, take that, take that away. Take away that stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been in there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they took the stone away, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of those people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take them grave clothes off and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen Jesus, what Jesus did, and they put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. For those that were there, I don't think they really understood exactly what Jesus was showing them. For all they understood, Jesus brought Lazarus back to life, an amazing miracle that they had witnessed. And like most of the things Jesus did and told them, they still have no idea what's coming. Now, the greatest story ever told starts with a manger and ends at the cross. But before Jesus dies at the cross, he is crucified between two other people. Luke 23, 39 through 46. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, and we're getting our what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus said, then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. But that's not exactly the end of the story. After Jesus was crucified and died, his body was put in a tomb sealed with a large stone. Roman guards were placed outside. As Pilate knew the story of the prophecy, but Easter morning, the stone was rolled away 
and Jesus' body was never found. For those who followed Jesus and his disciples knew well the miracles Jesus had performed while they were with him. And Jesus appeared to 500 some people, showing them the wounds he had suffered during his crucifixion, crucifixion and death. But why move the stone covering the tomb? Why was the, stole, the stone rolled away to an empty tomb? Jesus could have just appeared to his disciples just as it's written in the Bible without the stone being moved. Is it possible it happened that way so the disciples would have demanded the tomb be open and unsealed to reveal exactly what? A human body Jesus didn't need anymore? Or to be empty as it was and the rest of the New Testament exactly the way it was written? So why roll the stone away? Jesus had done a lot of things that most people just can't do. He walked on water. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He casted out demons, and he raised the dead. Are we to believe that after his death on the cross and the stone covering his tomb, it needed to be moved? Jesus said he was from the kingdom of heaven, and he was here too from Matthew 5:17. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, fulfill the promise of the Old Testament. So even after he was crucified, died in tomb, and that tomb sealed, why move it? Jesus Christ was the Messiah and definitely could have done everything after he was entombed without the stone being moved. I believe God had sent an angel to roll that stone away to have his disciples wake up and believe that they had been part of something that Jesus was teaching. They had to remember him and tell his story. The kingdom of heaven isn't for everyone. Jesus said, there are many mansions in my father's kingdom, and I go to prepare room for you. What are you preparing for Jesus? So early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. I don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples ran to see the tomb. The other disciple outran Peter and got there first. He stopped and looked and saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon and Peter arrived and went inside, and he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying to the side. Was that important? Absolutely. It's really significant. So why did Jesus fold the burial cloth after his resurrection? I never noticed this. The Gospel of John 27 tells us that the napkin, which was placed over Jesus' face, was not just thrown aside like with the, with the grave clothes. The Bible takes an entire verse to tell us that the napkin was neatly folded and placed separate from the grave clothes. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, you have to understand a little bit about Hebrew tradition of that day. The folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant. And every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and the servant would wait just out, out of sight until the master had finished eating, and the servant would not dare touch the table until the master was finished. Now, if the master were done eating, he would rise up from the table, wipe his fingers and his mouth, and clean his beard, and would wad up the napkin and toss it onto the table. Then the servant would then know it was time to clear the table. For in those days, a wadded napkin meant, I'm done. But if the master got up from the table and folded his napkin and laid it beside the plate, the servant would not dare touch the table because a folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. 
Is that why the stone was rolled away? Now, sometimes I can relate to the person to the right side of Jesus on that cross. To be part of something unjust, knowing what I did, and knowing it was wrong. To realize that Jesus was being crucified, knowing he was an innocent man, and being thankful because he's saying a prayer for me. And I ask him to remember me when he gets to his kingdom. Like the song Matt just sang, I'm learning. But the most important conversation to have is that first time you talk to God. And what would you say? That I remember you in a book? I studied every word. I hid it in my heart like you told me to. And while you're standing there on them trembling knees, what would you hope God says back to you? I remember you. I was there when you were born. I held your mama's hand and your daddy's too. Oh, I remember you. I recall the very day you turned against the devil and you cried out my name. And a stone was rolled away. So I've got to ask, if anyone of you here have any, had any situations where you're physically moving something all by yourself, whatever burdens you were dealing with seem so overwhelming, you just don't know how to, and you're just about to give up. You feel the weight of the world on top of you, and yet somehow you move it or everything else works out. That sense of relief, like a stone, was rolled away. Is that stone in front of Jesus' tomb filled with the weight of our sins by God? Using an angel to move it out of the way? God knew us before we were born and brought us out of the darkness into the light to learn about Jesus and understand that Christ promised to bring us to salvation. And with that salvation, God brings us from the darkness of our tomb to understand why the stone was rolled away, that we as Christians need to believe in Jesus, that we need to find Jesus in our own hearts. Is that why Jesus didn't appear to everyone back then? Just to those who he knew and would believe in him. That we as Christians need to have faith in him. Not that I need to see Jesus today to believe, because I know I remember him, his sacrifice, and why his stone was rolled away. I'll be okay when I see him again. Learning more about God and his forgiveness, I realized that God didn't save Daniel from the lion's den. He saved him in the lion's den. God didn't save Jonah from the whale but he saved them in the whale. Jesus standing outside of Lazarus' tomb, Jesus said, roll that stone away and called Lazarus to come out. And after Jesus was put in a sealed tomb, God had an angel roll the stone away. God brought all four of them back into the light from darkness. When Mary tells the disciples Jesus is gone, and the, di and the disciples find an empty tomb with a folded napkin. His face with the folded napkin set aside, the other clothes. Is that why Jesus, or is that why God sent an angel to roll a stone away? For you to go find Jesus. Like many stories of the Bible and the past, to understand why things are the way they are explained. It is okay to question as long as you follow up with your own research. So you understand why, and I mean why with an exclamation point and not with a question. Is that why the stone was rolled away?